Welcome to week four of Hot Messes. Um, if you feel attacked, if this is your first time, you're like, man, he's talking about me immediately. No, it's, I'm not. I'm not attacking you because the truth is we are all hot messes. So the past uh, uh, three weeks we've been going through this and it's been a great, a lot of fun. If you've missed it, go online, check it out. Uh, start from the beginning. I guarantee it'll be worth it. Uh, but I believe in my life, the best hot mess is one of my favorite things, and it's a s'more. It, a s'more is not right unless it is a hot mess, right? And so you, you bite into it, and it just oozes all over your face. That's when it's best. And if we're honest with ourselves, that's the kind of hot mess that we want to be. We want to be the hot mess that people enjoy, the hot mess that people want in their life that actually enjoy having us there, not leaving a path of destruction, but leaving something good. But when it comes to being a hot mess, we've all have experienced this. Have you ever made a hot mess messier? Have you made a big mess an even hotter big mess? And we find ourselves in this spot, and I found myself in this spot uh, a couple of years ago. The house that we used to live in, so the one before we're in, we're now, it's actually closer to where we are um, geographically, and. One uh, Thanksgiving, we decided we're going to, you know, uh, deep fry some turkey. So a lot of fun, very dangerous thing, have some correct supervision, do it outside. And so we did it outside, did the whole thing, awesome turkeys, it was really good. So afterwards, the thing that don't really talk about very much is like, now that you have three gallons of oil, what do you do with it, right? So I started Googling and some people were like, save it. You put it back into the container and you save it. You use it for next year, which I don't understand. Um, I, I don't do that. Uh, but then also just put it back in the container and then you can dispose of it that way. You can actually just kind of throw it away. And I'm like, okay. So I empty it all back into the same container. Again, this is a three-gallon jug of oil. And I put it all back in there and I thought to myself, at the, where we were living at the time, it was a detached garage, and it was kind of like a, a trek to get there. There were things in the way. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to put it behind the gate, behind the fence on our driveway, and tomorrow I'm going to deal with it, right? Because I'm wore out I'm doing all this turkey frying. And I, so I leave it in the jug on the driveway. The next morning comes, and let me just preface this. If you are a cat person, great. But this is one of the reasons why I don't like cats. So I go outside, and, uh, and I'm, I look, and... The driveway has this glisten all over it, like it's like shining, and I'm like, I, that's not right. It didn't rain or, or anything like that, and, I, and I'm, I'm looking, I'm like, well, where's the jug? And I, and I go over to the jug. A cat had bit a hole in the bottom, not on the top, bottom corner of the jug, bit a tiny hole. And so over the eight hours or 12 hours that I had left it there, it's just been slowly leaking out all over the driveway. Sure, the cat got a couple of licks in, uh, but it had his fill and then left me with this mess. And so I'm looking at him like, oh, geez, what do I do with this, right? So what would you do first? What would you do? Water hose. That's right, the water hose. That is a bad idea bad idea to use the water hose. And I learned that the hard way. So I get the water hose, start spraying it. Of course, oil water don't mix. I just end up spreading it. And then I'm like, oh man, now I got to somehow get it up. And so I get like a broom or squeegee and I start trying to pull it. All I did was just put it even more into the grooves of the concrete. And then finally I went and got some Dawn and I put it on there. And it, honestly, it didn't do much because the damage had been done. And to that day, every time I walked in the driveway, I was reminded, because there's one big block of driveway that was a different shade of gray because of the oil had seeped in. And so there was just, I tried to take a big mess and clean it quickly, and I just ended up making it messier. When we feel like a hot mess most in our lives, financially, relationally, professionally, there will always be bad options. There will always be bad options, a way to clean up that mess. Uh, financially, it's usually we're like, borrow more. Anybody with, with some smarts about them say, no, just, if you're really in debt, quit taking more money. Quit, don't do that. Make money. Don't take money that you have to pay back. Uh, some of us, relationally, we end up in hot water. We did something we shouldn't do. And they're like, oh, just lie more. That doesn't work. Okay. It might put a band-aid on the moment, but you, you're, you're end up putting yourself in a bigger mess. 
um, at work professionally. We talk to our boss the wrong way. We snapped at somebody. Somebody snapped at us. We were rude to a customer or we worked with a customer we shouldn't have, you know, all these things. And it puts us in a hot mess at, at work. And what do we do there? We avoid. We think if we just avoid them, it'll go away. I'm an Enneagram 7, and, it, and it's, my inkling is to when I, I'm having an issue is to go take a nap. Uh, when there's a problem, just go to sleep, you know, and, and you don't have to think about the problem anymore. I've learned in my adult life and my maturity that it doesn't go away. It's still waiting on you when you wake up. So you might as well just deal with it so that when you wake up in your nap or sleep that you don't have a problem in front of you. I've, I've had to learn that lesson the hard way. They don't go away, and sometimes they actually grow, which is not good. So these options that we have are usually quick fixes. Like, man, I, I, I think I can fix this really quick, but it ends up putting us in an even worse position than we were before. So today, we're going to finish up the collection, Hot Mess, with an Old Testament story. Um, this character modeled how to not become an even bigger hot mess. And that, and that essentially is our goal. We're going to be talking about David. So here's the context, kind of David's story. When David was just a shepherd boy, uh, the prophet Samuel came to his home and told his family, he's going to be king, right? And so you can imagine kind of the pressure of that and kind of this wow moment of like, oh, he's going to end up being king one day. That's, that's amazing. The only problem was there was already a king. There was already a king, and his name was Saul. And Saul had a son. And with any, you know, kingship or lineage, it's passed down in the family, right? And so if Samuel goes out and says, this other random kid is going to be king and not his kid, you can imagine the turmoil that begins, the frustration and, and the thoughts that Saul is having about this random child, right? So fast forward a couple, couple of years, then there was the story of David and Goliath about a little boy, essentially a teenager, that came along and slayed the giant everybody was afraid of, even though he was just a kid with a rock, right? And so when he did that, he became even more popular, right? He, he was an uh, instantaneous sensation overnight. The kingdom loved him. And so Saul found himself in the shadow, right? So as David kept doing these great, cool things that God was using him for, and he began to grow in his influence, it casted a shadow that Saul did not like, and he felt like he was in that shadow. So this is where we find ourselves. David's around, he slayed Goliath, he, his influence is growing, so he's very involved in the kingdom. People follow him, people look up to him, he's very popular. And so this is where we're going to start in 1 Samuel 18, 14. It says, in everything he did, he had great success. It's like no matter what he touched, David just did great. It just kept getting better and better. When Saul saw how successful he was, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he led them in their campaign. So Saul had this, and this is sometimes that happens in bad leadership, is that when you can't beat them, control them. You ever been there? You ever been like somebody just kind of putting their thumb on you and holding you down? Right? It's bad, it's bad leadership. That's not, that's not well, some leadership you want to be under. But he thought, if I can't beat him, I'm going to control him. So what, how can he control him? Is he tries to marry him off to one of his daughters. He says, okay, king, if you're going to be king one day, you know, you might as well marry one of my kids, right, one of my, my daughters. And so he tries to control him that way. David refuses, but Saul tries again with another daughter. And I don't know if it one daughter was different than the other daughter, really, but he offers again. But when the king is coming to you and say, I want you to marry my daughter, no, no, thank you. And he's real humble about it. He's like, I'm just, I'm just a shepherd. You know, I, I'm not worthy of that. And he comes back again, no, I have another daughter. I want you to marry this one. At some point, you got to say yes, right? The king keeps coming. So he tells him the bride price to have my daughter is 100 Philistines. Now, I'll let you go back in Scripture and read the story. He asked for something specific off these Philistines. And what he asked off these, this body part, 
you would, if it was me, if I was a Philistine, you'd have to kill me to take it. Okay, you're, you're not taking it. And he had to collect these things and, uh, and, so, and take them. So he took this, this bloody evidence back, right? And so this is what it says at, at Saul in, in verse 17. Saul said to himself, I will not raise a hand against him. Let the Philistines do that. So he was hoping, I'm going to control him. And this opportunity to control his actions, and I'm going to send him out. It's like, so I don't look like the bad guy. I'm going to send him out and make him hunt and, and chase 100 Philistines, and maybe one of them will kill him and take care of my dirty work for him. Actually, just like David always does, he goes above and beyond. He collects 200 of whatever it is that he had to collect from these Philistines to prove that he killed these Philistines, and he brings that back. So not only did he know the assignment, he excelled in the assignment, poor Philistines. Um, but and then we're down to verse 28, it says, when Saul realized that the Lord was with David and that his daughter Michael loved David, Saul became still more afraid of him, and he remained his enemy for the rest of his days. Over time, tension escalated. Because if he already didn't like him and he tried to mess him up, try to give him a task that would hopefully kill him and take him out, and he excelled at it? You can, can you imagine how just furious Saul was becoming? And so and then he shifted from, I can't beat him, I got to kill him myself. He's like, I can't beat him, I'm not going to control him anymore, I'm just going to kill him. So Saul becomes obsessed with killing David because he wanted to preserve the throne for his blood-born son. And so he had to get David out of the way. So Saul eventually actually tries to kill him himself. They're in the courtyard, and he takes a spear, and he tries to turn David into a shish kebab in front of everybody. But he misses. And so what does David going to do, of course? Like what anybody would do, they would flee. He, fl he fled. He ran. He got out of that situation. And so David found himself in a hot mess. Hot mess. David wasn't perfect, but man, he found himself in a hot mess. And even worse, a hot mess that he didn't create. None of it was his fault. He was truly a victim in this. He didn't choose to be the kid anointed king. He didn't ask for that. He didn't say, oh, please, Saul. I mean, Samuel, come, come anoint me to be king so I can be a problem for Saul. He never said that. God said it through Samuel, and he's just living his life, and now he's being hunted for it. And then, of course, the Goliath thing, that didn't help his situation, made him super popular. He tried not to marry the king's daughter, and he led every dangerous campaign he was assigned. So not only was he popular and he did cool things, he succeeded in everything that he did. Nevertheless, he has now found himself on the run. Even though it's none of his fault, he did everything he was supposed to do, now he's on the run. And so when he goes on the run, he does what any natural leader would do in that moment, is that he essentially, he finds all the enemies of Saul, all the people that have been rejected by Saul, anybody, the outcasts of Saul, and he kind of creates his own like little army, his own like body, his own militia, right? And so he's out there on the run. He knows that Saul is going to be hunting him. <clears throat> and, um, and so because of their feelings towards Saul, they were loyal to David. So if what we're about to discover was true for David, who didn't ask for the mess, and it wasn't his fault, it is very, very true for those of us who are the purveyors of our own hot mess. If you are the one that puts yourself in the hot mess, which we would all say probably 80 to 90% of the time, we are the reason for our hot messes. This is going to be extremely true for you. All right. So Saul is going through wars. He's doing things, fighting against the Philistines, and then he returns. That's where we're going to pick up. First uh, Samuel 24, 1, it says, After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David um, is in the desert of Ingedah. So Saul took 3,000, 3,000, think about that, 3,000 uh, able young men from Israel and came out to look for David and his men near Craigs of the wild goats. 
He came to the sheep pens along the way. Now, uh, it, a cave was there. So just to kind of give you an idea, it's kind of like the hill country. Um, there's not a whole lot of greenery uh, in this part of it. It's just kind of a lot of rock, kind of deserty. But there's hills, and there's a lot of little caves, and a lot of little big rocks to hide behind, right? And so a cave was there, and Saul went to relieve himself. All right, this is one of the few times in the scriptures you will find them talking about going to the bathroom. All right, and this is what it says. Saul went to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. David knew he was coming. He saw he was coming, and David had a great idea. He's like, okay, guys, instead of us just keep running and they keep chasing us, because eventually they're going to catch up to us, instead of doing that, let's hide in the mountains, in the hills, in the cave. Let's hide, let them pass, and then we're going to go to the opposite direction. It's a pretty great idea, right? They did not know this was going to happen. They did not account for the fact that they would stop and Saul would have to relieve himself, that he would need to go to the bathroom. What are the odds of that? If Saul, and if you play it in your head, if Saul was David's problem, this was God's solution to David's problem. And everybody with David actually recognized it. And it says in verse 4, the men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. I mean, think about that chance, the opportunity, the, the minimum bloodshed, the lack of drama to that. And I think there is a, not just to be funny, but there's an important reason why it's in Scripture that he went to relieve himself. Because have you ever felt more vulnerable than when you're going to the bathroom? I think that's our most vulnerable times as humans. If you have a dog and you walk a dog, that's why the dog, when he goes in the bathroom, stares you in the eyes because he needs comfort because he is exposed in front of everybody in the most vulnerable situation. Help me. Help me out of this, right? That's what dogs do. And it's just true. So David had this chance with the king in his most vulnerable situation. He wasn't even in his own private bathroom. He's out in the wild, has no, no idea, completely vulnerable. It's like he's been put up on a silver platter. So you can imagine David gets caught up in the emotion of the, I'm going to do unto him what he's planning to do unto me. And David had told the guys what God had promised, and that's what the guys were repeating back to him. Um, and this was their only chance of minimum bloodshed. I mean, just imagine the drama, the moment in that right? And, 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 he, and he sees it, and he's like, here it is. Here it comes. Here is my chance to get the leg up on him. It's kind of like the Eight Mile soundtrack. Better lose yourself in the music, the moment you own it. You better never let it go. You got one shot. Do not miss your chance to flow. Opportunity only comes once in a lifetime. Come on, y'all not impressed by that? Come on. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Woo! I practiced that the most in this whole thing <laughs> to make sure I got that right because I didn't want to be embarrassed. Uh, so David walks out, and just like when you hear that song or your favorite song or you have this moment where you feel goosebumps, it's like this is meant to happen. Like if you're married, it's like when your wife, husband, you see them for the first time on that, your wedding day or you see your kid for the first time, or, you know, all this stuff, like, it's like, this is supposed to happen. When you get that first big check with your real job, you know, this is supposed to happen. It feels so good. That's what David is feeling. It's almost supernatural to him. Everything is lining up. If ever there was a set of circumstances pointed to something, it is this. Do unto him as he intends to do unto me. So as he is preparing, being convinced, it's like beyond a shot. He just knows this is what's supposed to happen. Something happens to him. Something clicks in his head. And this might be why God chose him to be king. It might be what God saw and used Samuel to go communicate. And what was inside of David that whole time since birth that God wanted out of him for him to be king. And it was the virtue factor. It was the part of him that was virtuous. 
you can't, you ignore the virtue factor and you will eventually make an even bigger hot mess than you're already in. You can't clean up a mess caused by a failure of virtue with another failure of virtue. To dumb it down and make it simple, and you've heard this many times, two wrongs don't make a right. Saul was wrong for what he did. Now, be, even though it was justified, what he was about to do was wrong. What David was about to do was wrong. And so he knew that. So back to the story. Verse 4, then David crept up unnoticed. And I, and I think in this moment, as he's having these chills, as he's having like, it's like, I've been in these moments where I'm like, I know what I, it's happening right now is very important. I, I know what it is. And it's kind of like everything just kind of goes into slow motion. You ever felt that way? Like, it's just everything just kind of slows down. And like, all of a sudden, all these thoughts are just running through your head. You're thinking faster than you've ever done. You're thinking about scenarios. How could this work out and all this? So he says, do I really, think this, do I really want this to be my story? I became king by sneaking up on the king in a cave while he was relieving himself and then murdered him? When my grandkids ask me, he's like, Dad, I mean, granddaddy, please tell me how you became king and what did you do to him and what was he doing in that moment? Is that the story that he wants? His lineage? Was he justified to do it? Absolutely. Under human circumstances, he was completely justified and nobody would have batted an eye or argued with him. Was it expected of him? Yes. That's why he was on the move. It was expected of him to do this. Was it virtuous? No, it wasn't. So he hesitated. It says, verse 4, Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He had this hesitation, this virtue that dinged him. And so instead of killing him, he just cut off a sliver of the robe. Now, in this time, you're thinking, oh, Saul got off. No, in this time, that was considered an act of trying to kill the king. Touching the king, bringing a knife to the king, slicing anything off the king was considered an act of war. And you would be put to death for trying to do so. And so what he did, even though it wasn't the full amount of what Saul deserved, it was actionable. And so, and then he kind of went halfway in doing that and kind of slumped away. And it says in verse 5, Afterward, David was conscious stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. Now, can you imagine the men when he goes back and he's like, I didn't do it, but I cut off a corner and I feel terrible about it. You can imagine the eye roll his men had, like, oh, brother, you had your chance and you missed it? How could you be so dumb? How could you let this chance go? Now we're all going to die, and it's because of you. Why didn't you take your opportunity? Could you imagine the, the anger, the, the, the disdain that they were feeling? Continue on in verse 6, it said, He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should, touch, should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay a hand on him. For he is anointed of the Lord. He's telling them, it's not my responsibility to replace what God put in place. I don't want to become king by murdering the king. You ever find yourself in a situation where somebody's trying to give you advice on somebody that you're dating or whatever it may be, uh, work, someone that you're trying to work for, and their story is a little icky, and you're like, well, they did this to that person, but they won't do it to me. Why not? They did it to them. Why won't they do it to you? Why are you so much more special than any other human? You have to build that trust. There's a process that you have to go through. But the initial reaction, if I'm, I know that this boss did this underhanded thing to get big, and, and, uh, but you know, he's not going to do that anymore. Why not? Paul, I mean, uh, uh, David notices that a pattern is going to develop. If I murder this king, what's going to happen to me? I'm going to be murdered, right? I'm going to start a pattern of deceit and, and, and distrust in and, and a place where it's, people are just fighting. Rather than God anointing and someone being king, it's about taking it. Continue on, verse 7. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. 
And Saul left the cave and went his way, having no idea what happened. Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul. I imagine the men were trying, trying, don't, don't, don't do it. Don't go out there. But he does. He goes out there and he says this in verse 10. This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay my hand on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. And then in verse 12, may the Lord judge between you and me. And may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me. But my hand will not touch you. He said, I'm opting for virtue over hurting you. You ever been in that situation of like, oh, man, if I, if I was a worse man, <laughs> if I was meaner, oh, boy, I'd go off. You ever been there? That's what he's feeling in this moment. I chose the right thing, not the expected thing. There's been many moments in my life, and I'm sure in your life, that people are like, they deserve it. Give it to them. And something clicks inside of you, and you choose not to. Do the right thing and trust God to determine the outcome. That's what David did right here. Saul was humiliated, so he leaves. He flees from that. They go back. Seven chapters later, a random arrow pierces Saul's armor, and David becomes king. David didn't have to take it into his own hands. God did exactly what he said he was going to do. He fulfilled it without David having to give up on his virtue. Every hot mess that you are and that you come upon is a defining moment in your life. You have a choice to make. On the heels of every hot mess are bad options. Usually a quick fix is more like quicksand. You do the quick fix, you're not really out of it, and now you just find yourself sinking, having to do another quick fix, and you and just sink harder, further, further. If you've ever seen the Indiana Jones, you know, like quicksand, bad, bad, bad quicksand. You don't want to be in quicksand. You'll just sink further and further the more you struggle. Hot messes, hot messes are prepackaged with some bad options. They make the hot mess even messier. So one day, your, your mess will be reduced to one sentence or two. I went through a divorce because I... I was fired because I did. I had an affair because I, I flunked out because I gave up. I had to declare bankruptcy because of a decision I made in. That's the quick fixes. That's what happens. Just because you naturally lean to self-preservation doesn't mean you have to. Your action as a hot mess will become your real story. It's in a permanent part of your story after you make that decision. So what would your story tell? Which of your options do you want to be a permanent one, a permanent part of your story? Don't opt for the option that makes you a liar, known as a liar. Don't opt for the something that makes you a hypocrite and everybody knows it. Don't use someone's bad behavior as an excuse for bad behavior. If you don't do these things, you will feel better. And you've given an opportunity for God to decide what your outcome is. That's why he says, in our weaknesses, he is strong. So it doesn't matter if it's your weakness or weakness that's put on you, whether it's your mess you caused or a mess that was given to you. If you just give it to Christ and let him lead you, he will change your scenario. There's this time in my life when I, when I meet with people and they're, they're up against a hot mess decision. They are a hot mess. I, and I wish people would listen to this because I've learned this the hard way. When you are in a hot mess situation, people don't care how you got there or why you got there. They want to know how you dealt with it. So like at churches, like when people are not getting along, there's bad leadership or whatever it may be, and someone wants to leave and go do something else and they have the opportunity to make a, a big fuss. And I tell them, I said, people aren't going to care why you left. They're going to remember how you left. 
how you dealt with the situation. And that is what's going to be planted down deep in their mind. So to close in all of this, number one, you will be tempted to become a bigger hot mess. The real story isn't your hot mess. It's what you do with it is your story. Because if we're truthful, we're all hot messes, and we can only control ourselves. We want the quick fixes, an eye for an eye, but Jesus asks you to do something different. He says, follow me. Follow me. You don't have to go get vengeance. That's why it says in Scripture, vengeance is the Lord's. You don't have to do that. If you will just follow him, he will lead you out of those messes, and he will cause you to be something bigger than you ever thought you could be on your own. When you do, he takes responsibility for the outcome of your journey. Your hot mess will simply be the context to what your real story is. That is how you become the hot mess that people want to be around. (laughs) Because you're not going to be able to change it. You are a hot mess. This might be a, a come to Jesus moment for you. You are, each and every one of us, we are hot messes. And I I told that story about David because he did that cool thing, right, in virtuous moment. But if you keep reading the story of David, he did some pretty crappy things. (laughs) He did some of the things that happened to him. But people still wanted to be around him. He was still a hot mess that people wanted to follow. I'm not saying you're not always going to get it right. You're not always going to have the right answer. He did some dumb stuff, but still... God anointed him to be king. So even in your dumb stuff, even in your hot messes, God is, can still anoint you to do great things, and he has. So let him. Stop trying to force and control everything in your life to make it your justice, but live virtuously and let him lead you and follow him out of your messes. I guarantee you, your story will be far greater than everything you create on yourself, by yourself. So to help you with that, guys, as you leave today, we have a gift for all of you. Take as many as you can, because I will eat them all if you don't take them. We have little packaged s'mores. And this week, I want you to eat that s'more. You can do it in the microwave. You can do it. Just make sure it's melty. You know, you can use fire, whatever it is. Just make sure it's nice and melty and messy. But as you do that, I want you to think about that. Think about, man, I want to be the hot mess that people want around. I want to be the hot mess that God uses to make this world better, to put a good taste in people's mouths when they talk about me. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much that you didn't just say, figure it out, but Lord, you came down and you showed us the way. You gave us the example, how to live virtuously, Lord. And thank you for the example. Thank you for David and Paul and and, and Matthew, all of them, all that followed you and had the guts to do that. Thank you for their stories that we could read them and follow them and learn from them and apply it to our lives. So Lord, as we navigate this life from the unavoidable hot messes that we are, I pray that we choose virtue over everything, that we continue to follow you. And Lord, not to be vengeful, but to let you resolve the outcomes of our life and our messes. So Lord, we hand them to you. We have, we, I pray for the courage and guts to hand you our messes so that you can do something miraculous in it. And Lord, as a church, as Village Heights, as a family, I pray that, that we do the same thing in our neighborhood and all that we do, that we do it virtuously, that we don't bend just for culture's sake or we don't bend to politics for politics' sake, Lord, but that we stay true to the mission that you've called us on, to continue to reach the people that people don't want to reach, to continue to, to go after the people that are just too far out there, to continue to love in a way that doesn't make sense, as we continue to choose virtue. So Lord, help us in that process. Help us to see the light and see the areas and to give us the courage to live for you and not for ourselves. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.